Hello everyone, my name is Mary Catherine Vaughn and I'm a PhD candidate at the Hospital for Sick Children and the University of Toronto in Canada. Today I'm happy to be giving a presentation for Lab Roots on the Caliper Initiative, Closing the Gap. The learning objectives of my presentation today are to discuss the importance of age and sex-specific interpretation in blood tests in children and adolescents, to introduce the Canadian Laboratory Initiative on Pediatric Reference Intervals, and finally, to discuss the recent data Caliper has published in hopes to close the gap in the availability of pediatric reference standards for biomarkers of health and disease. So pediatric laboratory medicine plays a central role in healthcare. Not only does the lab provide the majority of objective medical data to patient charts, it also uses this data to assist in the identification of risk factors and symptoms, the diagnosis of disease, determining appropriate treatment, and also evaluating response to that treatment as well. It is therefore essential that the blood test results reported to patient charts are accurate and accurately interpreted as well. In pediatrics and in adolescents and adults, there are various ways to interpret a blood test. Firstly, we have reference intervals. Reference intervals can be defined as health-associated benchmarks used to assist in clinical decision-making. They are typically represented by the 2.5 and 95, 7.5 percentiles in a healthy reference distribution. And this is as per CLSI or Clinical Laboratory Standard Institute guidelines, as well as other governing bodies. In contrast, we also have clinical decision limits which serve as threshold values where a flagging below or above this value may indicate at risk of significant disease or be specific for diagnostic criteria of disease. A key example of this is HbA1c, which is used in the diagnosis and stratification of diabetes and prediabetes routinely in both the pediatric and adult population. Now, CLSI states that when decision limits are available and that they're determined by national or worldwide consensus, they should be used as opposed to reference intervals. Reference intervals really just represent the normative range of blood test results that can be expected in a particular population, while clinical decision limits are often more evidence-based for a specific disease and can be of higher value in that case, such as in the diagnosis of various heart diseases, diabetes, among others. Unfortunately, clinical decision limits are not available for the majority of laboratory tests, and thus reference intervals are commonly used and reported to patient charts for test interpretation. Now, there are various ways to calculate a reference interval, and they can be divided into two different categories. The first category, which is known to most laboratory scientists, is the direct method. The direct method involves recruiting healthy subjects for the sole purpose of establishing a reference interval. The benefits of this approach is that it is the gold standard by CLSI and other guidelines, and it can be very robust, evidence-based, and accurate as you are asking a population that does not have any underlying medical conditions and are thus a true representation of a healthy population. However, the limitations to this approach are that it is very costly, it does require significant resources to be able to recruit a healthy cohort, and this is particularly exacerbated in children and adolescents. In contrast, the indirect method is a method for calculating reference intervals that harnesses the power of stored laboratory data that's located in your LIS system or in other patient databases in order to create a reference interval. Now, direct methods have been around, or rather indirect methods have been around for a while, but they've really been getting traction in the past few years due to the improvements in the statistical models available to laboratory scientists. The main benefit, of course, of the indirect method is that it requires basically no resources other than expertise, time, and access to a laboratory information system database. However, the limitations are that it does require statistical methods to be able to deconvolve a mixed population data set, including both healthy individuals and patients, and deconvolve that into an only healthy distribution, which can be quite challenging based on more historic techniques but we've seen a lot of development in the past few years and improvements in these techniques, 
making it feasible for laboratories to actually use this method for the establishment of reference intervals. However, for the majority of my talk today, I will be focusing on the direct method and how it applies to Caliper and our study. Now, particularly in pediatrics, there are various challenges associated with test result interpretation. Firstly, there are major gaps in pediatric reference intervals and also clinical decision limits. And this is largely due to the fact that there is a high need for resources, as well as ethical limitations limiting sampling from children and neonates. This can lead to inaccurate or erroneous interpretation if an adult-based reference interval is used to interpret tests in pediatrics. It can also increase the risk of misdiagnosis or inappropriate treatment, or lack thereof. And in addition, it can increase stress for patients and families, which is quite true in children in particular. In addition, there is a lack of standardization or harmonization of assay methodology in laboratory medicine. And this is a problem for both pediatrics and adults, where an assay methodologies differ across manufacturers, and as children visit several medical centers due to the increasing integration of healthcare networks that may use different assays or different systems or simply report different reference intervals, it can lead to inconsistent patient management. And both these combined should be regarded as a major source of laboratory error, affecting both patient care and patient safety. Now, there are various covariates to consider in pediatric test result interpretation. The Caliper team here at SickKids likes to say children are not small adults. Indeed, there are several physiological processes that occur throughout growth and development, and a few are listed on this slide, including the fact that body weight will double by six months of age and triple by 12 months of age. Body length also increases by 50% in the first year of life. We also see major organ systems grow and mature from birth to adolescence. And this can include sexual maturation that can definitely impact pediatric biochemistry and the analytes measured in blood tests, such as sex hormones, liver enzymes, among others. Therefore, pediatric reference intervals need to reflect differences in the physiological function at different ages, sex, ethnicity, as well as BMI. And this can be quite challenging because it means that a lot of different reference intervals that are stratified by these covariates are needed for accurate test result interpretation, and these studies can be quite challenging to do. One example of the need for pediatric reference intervals and age and sex-specific interpretation in childhood and adolescence is ALP, or alkaline phosphatase, which can be a marker of liver as well as bone damage and disease. In children, they have significantly higher ALP levels as compared to adults. If you look on the right hand of the slide, I'm showing a graph that we published um, in a previous paper where we have ALP levels in the pediatric period from 0 to 20 years of age on the x-axis, followed by adult ALP levels up to 80 years of age. And we can clearly see that if you apply a pediatric test result, or rather an adult reference standard for pediatric test result interpretation, you're going to flag the majority of ALP values as high. And this is concerning because it can impact treatment, lead to unnecessary follow-up, and potentially miss diagnoses that require low ALP, such as hypophosphatasia. So here's an example of how ALP is used in children. It's relatively common for primary care physicians to encounter children with elevated ALP levels, and it's therefore incredibly important that we use age and sex-specific reference intervals to better reflect the physiology throughout growth and development. In this case, elevated ALP can be due to bone disease as well as liver disease, which can cause referral to gastroenterology. And for a primary care physician, it's important to identify these elevations immediately such that the patient can go through the proper course of treatment and identification of underlying conditions. So there are various initiatives that have sought to seek this gap in pediatric reference standards due to the fact that we can see a clear need for the need of age and sex-specific test interpretation. And I've included a list of some of the most prominent pediatric reference interval initiatives around the world, including Australia and New Zealand, as well as the Caliber Initiative here in Canada, Child X from the United States, the Copenhagen Initiative from Denmark, as well as the KIGS Initiative from Germany, and the Look Initiative from Australia. All of these initiatives focus on different age groups, 
some from birth to 18, some focusing specifically from five years of age and older, and others doing point estimates at eight, 10, and 12 years of age. In addition, they differ slightly in statistical methodology and also the biomarkers studied, with some focusing more on cardiac and common blood analytes and others focusing on specialized testing. For the purpose of my presentation today, I'm going to be talking about the Caliper Initiative, which I have been very grateful to be a part of throughout my PhD studies. So the Caliber Initiative was started back in 2009 by clinical chemists here in Canada. It's currently led by Dr. Kazro Adeli here at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, but many Canadian laboratories have contributed over the years leading to the success of this initiative. To begin, the Caliber study had three main objectives. The first was to determine the key covariate effect on reference intervals for biochemical parameters in healthy children and adolescents as well to develop a comprehensive database of covariate stratified reference intervals, and finally to disseminate study results to the pediatric healthcare community worldwide through novel knowledge translation strategies to ensure that this data was accessible not only to Canadian laboratories, but also pediatric institutions across the world. And in the past 10 years, Caliper has made significant strides to addressing these objectives, publishing several articles, and developing a unique strategy and cohort recruitment. So the Caliper strategy that we've applied over the past 10 years is a multi-stage approach to recruitment, followed by robust laboratory and statistical analysis in alignment with CLSI or Clinical Laboratory Standard Institute guidelines. I provided a brief flowchart here on this slide, but I will go in depth into each of these steps that we have undertaken in the past few years in order to complete our studies. The first and most important part, of course, is promotional recruitment. And we do this by engaging in partnerships with community centers, schools, and other institutions of the community. We therefore collect samples in the community as well as here at the Hospital for Sick Children from the siblings of patients and families. Following sample collection, the samples are processed according to CLSI guidelines and stored in our biobank at minus 80 degrees Celsius. They then perform laboratory analysis for several biomarkers of health and disease, and reference intervals are established using a robust method as recommended by CLSI guidelines. They are then published in peer-reviewed journals and finally uploaded to our online database, which I will speak about in a moment. So in terms of our recruitment process, I would say this is the most challenging portion of the Caliper Initiative, and we have had success due to the great work of Caliper coordinators, students, and volunteers, as well as our community partnerships. To date, Caliper has established partnerships with over 200 community organizations here in Canada, including schools, recreational centers, art festivals, as well as various extracurricular activities. I'm providing a few images here on my slide of past Caliper participants, of course, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, where we see these participants actually participate at their local school and various other community centers. They're able to do this by signing consent prior with their parents, completing health questionnaires, and then donating a blood sample at their school where we bring a small team of trained sick kids staff, including nurses and phlebotomists. An important aspect of Caliper is that in contrast to other studies, Caliper uses healthy community children, and therefore there is no underlying medical conditions in these children and adolescents, and they are not visiting the hospital for any type of underlying comorbidity. This increases the robustness of the database and also the value of health associated values in a robust reference database. The recruitment of these initiatives has led to the establishment of a biobank that we house here in Toronto. And to date, we've collected samples for over 12,000 children in the past 10 years due to the great work of our team. We've collected mostly serum and serum separator tubes, but we've also collected whole blood in EDTA, as well as plasma in both EDTA and lithium heparin in order to expand our study to more specialized testing that require a certain matrix. These samples range in age from birth to adolescence, and they are all associated with health information that we obtain from their health questionnaires, including family history, health status, BMI, and ethnicity. We use this health information to apply inclusion and exclusion criteria. Our main exclusion criteria will include the use of prescribed medication, the appearance of chronic illness, such as diabetes or thyroid disease, 
the history of acute illness within seven days of collection, such as an infection. And we have a few other metrics, including pregnancy and other prescribed or non-prescribed medications. Following the application of inclusion and exclusion criteria, we stored the samples by centrifuging them and aliquoting them within eight hours of collection. And as I mentioned, they're all stored in our minus 80 biobank. Following that, they are thawed at room temperature and they undergo laboratory analysis for several biomarkers of health and disease. To date, we've actually um, tested for over 200 biomarkers on several analytical platforms. This is important to the Caliper team to make an, a, a concerted effort rather to establish reference standards for these biomarkers on the analytical platforms that are available here in Canada and worldwide to ensure that every pediatric institution has the appropriate reference standards for the laboratory instrument and also their patient population. So following laboratory analysis, it is actually time to establish the reference interval. And Caliper established this process that is in alignment with CLSI guidelines. I provided the flow chart here, which walks you through each step. And I encourage you to look at our Caliper white paper in Critical Reviews in Laboratory Sciences that was published in 2017. But I'll go through each step briefly. Firstly, we always visually inspect the data and we manually remove any extreme outliers that do not fit the distribution. We then test age and sex partitions using the Harris and Boyd method. And this second step as demonstrated in the flowchart is very important because for some biomarkers such as alkaline phosphatase, we will need several age and sex specific partitions. However, for other markers such as calcium or sodium that are very stable and tightly regulated, we won't necessarily need any age and sex specific partition. So this is an important step that is very pediatric specific. We then go on to test each partition for normality using QQ plots as well as the Shapiro-Wilkes test. We remove outliers using the Tukey or adjusted Tukey method depending on the distribution. And following that, we will establish reference intervals either using the non-parametric method or the robust method of Horn and Pesh depending on the sample size. So Caliper has followed this strategy from participant recruitment all the way to statistical, statistical analysis in the past 10 years. And we've completed this initiative in three phases, I would say, um, due to the great work of past Caliper students, coordinators, and fellows, as well as clinical chemists. The first phase, which I have not been involved in, was the initial studies. Caliper really wanted to cover, cover your bread and butter chemistry as well as the key amino assays that are available and regularly tested in pediatric healthcare institutions. So initially there was an initial publication published in Clinical Chemistry in 2012, focusing on proteins and enzymes in pediatrics as well as lipids and other main chemistries. This was then followed by a specialized chemistry paper that focused on more specialized techniques such as immune markers, alpha-1 antitrypsin, haptoglobin, and others. We also completed several studies on key amino assays, which initially involved an endocrine paper that was published in clinical chemistry in 2013, followed by three follow-up papers in clinical chemistry on fertility and sex hormones, vitamins, and cancer markers. These initial publications were completed on the Abbott Architect platform, which we use here at the hospital for six children. But as I mentioned previously, it was important to the study team to ensure that our data set was not specific to one laboratory instrument and that it was useful to laboratories using other commonly used analytical platforms. So the next step was to apply what we found in the Abbott Architect to other instruments. So this phase two um, resulted in over 30 publications where we have analytical specific reference intervals for each test. For chemistry, as I've demonstrated here in this slide, we applied transference as per CLSI guidelines. And for immunoassays, we completed new studies by recruiting new children and completing reference value studies for over 300 to 600 participants on the five main analytical platforms in use in Canada. We've recently expanded to other platforms as well. I encourage you to look at our Caliper white paper to learn more about these studies and the statistical methodology applied. And the last phase that we are currently working on is expanding the utility of our database, not only to include these key biomarkers of health and disease, but also more specialized tests. And this is an initiative that, or this phase has been part of the initiative I have been most involved in. And I've included some key examples of analytes that we've currently been working on. 
including autoimmune disease markers, cytokines, cardiac testing, trace elements, uh, point of care testing, as well as hematology and coagulation. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'll also show you some preliminary and published data on these specialized studies. So firstly, as clinical chemists here at the Hospital for Sick Children, we mainly focused on chemistry and immunoassays, which use serum and plasma. However, hematology parameters do require age and sex-specific stratification due to puberty and the transition from fetal to adult erythropoiesis, which can change the reference value distributions for both leukocytes, erythrocytes, as well as platelet parameters. So we undertook a large study to establish reference intervals for the complete blood count, which is a very commonly ordered panel here in Canada and also across the world. Hematology testing requires the collection of fresh whole blood and analysis within eight hours, which had previously limited many studies from doing this in healthy children. However, we were able to use the caliper infrastructure to go into the community, collect these samples, and bring them back to the hospital for analysis within eight hours. We completed this in over 600 children, and we have three publications that are currently available, and I encourage you to go check them out. They're located here on this slide. We've established reference intervals for the main CDC parameters, including the white blood cell count, platelet count, hemoglobin, and red blood cell count that I've graphed here on these slides, as well as over 30 research use only parameters. Another gap in pediatric reference standards that we identified and wanted to address is point of care testing. Point of care testing is coming into prominence in pediatric healthcare institutions due to the low sample volumes required and also the rapid test turnaround time, as well as improvements in their accuracy in the past decade. So we wanted to use fresh whole blood collected from the community to establish reference standards for critical care parameters, including pH, PO2, PCO2, as well as the electrolytes and various metabolites, such as glucose and lactate. We did this by actually bringing point-of-care instruments, in this case the radiometer, ABL90, as well as various glucometers with us to the community to complete testing at the point of collection. And this data resulted in two publications where reference standards are established for 11 critical care parameters, and I encourage you to go check out these publications to learn more. The last example I have here is unpublished data from a study we are currently doing. Trace elements and heavy metals serve important roles in pediatric healthcare by testing for nutritional deficiency and also providing evidence for toxic metal exposure. However, there is very limited information, on particularly on up-to-date analytical platforms that use mass spectrometry for health-associated values in children and adolescents. So we went into the community and collected whole blood and plasma using royal blue top tubes as part of the caliper initiative. Over 300 children participated in this aspect of the project, and we analyzed the samples in collaboration with London Health Sciences, as well as Hamilton Health Sciences, which used high resolution mass spectrometry and ICPMS respectively. Reference intervals were then derived for over 30 trace elements in heavy metals, and I've provided a few examples on this slide, including selenium and zinc, which are essential trace elements um, analyzed in plasma in this case. And I've also provided an example of silver here analyzed in whole blood as a heavy metal. The study is currently ongoing, and we hope to have published data in the near future to add to our database. So we wanted to make sure that all of this data that Caliper has published, over 50 publications for over 200 biomarkers of health and disease, was accessible to pediatric healthcare institutions worldwide. So we recently updated our website, which exists at www.caliperproject.ca. I encourage you to take a look at it. It has new information for healthcare professionals, which includes information on our currently ongoing studies and sub-studies, as well as detailed information as to how we calculate a reference interval that can be useful for healthcare practitioners. It also links to our online database, which serves as a consolidation of all of our publications, providing the actual reference intervals, as well as the reference value distribution for every test we have evaluated in Caliper. If you access the database at www.caliperproject.org, um, you will go get to this interface. If you log in, it is freely accessible. You can input the laboratory test of interest, in this case, alanine aminotransferase, the unit you're interested in, your laboratory platform, 
and then it will provide the reference intervals in these tables. And you can also look at the scatter plots that we have derived on that instrument to look at the dynamic reference value distributions and also can be helpful in longitudinally monitoring patients. To date, the Caliper database has actually been used by over 5,000 registered users in over 100 countries globally. And I provided a map here where the blue dots um, indicate the use of the Caliper database or logins. And we can see that it truly has a global reach, which speaks to both the gap that existed prior to Caliper and the utility of the database. We can also look at the laboratory analytes that are most searched for on the database. And it's not surprising that some of the markers that come up first include TSH and free T4, markers of thyroid function, as well as alkaline phosphatase, a marker of limer damage, and ferritin, a marker of iron deficiency, and also inflammation. This information is also available through a mobile app, which can be downloaded free of charge by the Apple Store, as well as the Google Play Store. And it's essentially the same as the database, but you get a little bit more information, including the fact that you can actually input the test result you're interested in evaluating, and seeing where it lies across the reference interval. These apps were designed and targeted to community healthcare practitioners, as well as patients and families, to ensure easy accessibility to the Caliper data. So with that, Caliper has published over 50 publications in high impact journals, leading to the development of a robust database of up-to-date pediatric reference standards using a CLSI-based approach and also novel aspects, including community recruitment and application to several specialized biomarkers. The stored specimens in the Caliper Biobank have enabled the continued productivity of Caliper amid the COVID-19 pandemic which has been very encouraging to see our initiative still push forward and address gaps um, in this difficult time. And future work will focus on expanding the utility of the Caliber database to include novel biomarkers, as well as additional analytical platforms. And we will continue to upload our online database such that everyone can have access to these data easily. However, um, despite the main strides that Caliper has made in the past few years, there is one gap we'd still like to address, um, particularly laboratory test interpretation in pregnancy and the neonatal period. Briefly, we know that the diagnosis, prognostication, and monitoring of maternal health and pregnancy really relies on laboratory testing. And I provided a graphic here from a recent review we published in CRCLS. And you can see that some of the tests located here, such as the CBC, CRP, cardiac markers, are all used throughout the standard of care in pregnancy to identify complications that may impact the health of both mother and child. It's therefore very important that we have a comprehensive database of reference standards in pregnancy. In addition, I provided two examples of physiological units that undergo main changes throughout pregnancy, which would influence laboratory test results. Located in green here, I'm describing some of the physiological changes in liver function, including increase in amino acids, as well as various fold change in triglycerides, total cholesterol, as well as LDL and HDL, which is due to the fact that pregnancy can be anabolic, followed by catabolic in later periods to support the growth and nutrition of the fetus. This can influence laboratory test results and therefore using an adult-based interval, reference interval rather, for test interpretation in pregnancy is not appropriate. In addition, the same thing can be said for thyroid hormones, where we see various dynamic changes in thyroid binding globulin, as well as free T4, total T4, and TSH, requiring gestational age-specific differences. So it was our goal to kind of apply what we have done in Caliper to a pregnant population, and we have therefore established the Caliper Mother and Child Initiative. This initiative focuses on two aims, firstly to develop reference intervals in pregnancy in the postpartum, and we will use a similar approach to Caliper by recruiting individuals from the community and testing them at each trimester as well as the postpartum period to establish a comprehensive database of reference intervals. In addition, we'd like to follow their neonate and infant throughout the first year of life to improve the robustness of our evidence-based reference intervals in the neonatal period for Caliper. So we hope that this data will be available in the near future. And we know that laboratory investigations provide objective data to physicians, not only in pediatrics, but also in pregnancy. And that currently this can be compromised by the lack of pediatric and pregnancy specific test result interpretation guidelines. And therefore our initiative has really sought to address these gaps 
I provided a few examples today of how we have done this, our strategy, and key publications that have come out within the past year. We look forward to continuing this work throughout the next few years to continue to close the gap and update our database as analytical platforms change and new biomarkers are integrated into clinical practice. With that, I would like to thank the Sick Kids Caliper team, particularly Principal Investigator Dr. Cosro Adeli, as well as various other clinical laboratory students, such as the U of T fellows who circulate through here, clinical chemist laboratories here across Canada who have contributed, as well as the many Caliper participants, coordinators, students, and volunteers. So thank you very much, and please email me if you have any questions at all.